I have tried my hand at canning, and uh, it was something that my mother did when I was growing up. We always had these great tomato sauces and spaghetti sauces, salsa, green beans down in the basement in jars. When I tried it, let's just say I had a few canning conundrums. And it turns out I'm not alone. Joining me now via Zoom is uh, Judy Patel. She is a senior agent in Family Consumer Sciences for the University of Maryland Extension Office. Judy, thank you so much for joining us. So you actually give uh, workshops as part of your job on things like canning. Yes, absolutely. Um, so basically, my job as a Family and Consumer Sciences educator is to bring in research-based knowledge to our community members. And my focus area is nutrition, health, and wellness, including a food preservation. So I tend to do a very in-depth uh, in programming in the food preservation area where we learn about it and we do a hands-on activity with it. Um, so yes, I mean, it's, it's always fun, but right now in current times, it's really hard to do. I want to send out more information, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So you are going to go over what you call 10 canning conundrums. So basically those conundrums are something, a collection of uh, all the questions and comments my participants have reached out to me with, whether it's on call, email, or in person. So I've collected all those and created uh, this 10 list. Let's do it, number one. All right, so our number one and the most important one is incorrect, using incorrect uh, canning method. And what I mean by that is there are two different kinds of canning method that is approved by USDA standards and they are research-based. Uh, one is your water bath canning and the second one is fresher canning. Your water bath canning is something you use for high acid foods. You talked about uh, you know, using jams, jellies, uh, some of the salsa, those all foods are high acid foods because either they are naturally high in acid or you are adding acid in it to increase the acidity in the food. So those are great for water bath canning. However, for your pressure canning, you're using your vegetables, your sauces, your spaghetti sauce, they are naturally very low in acid, uh, and so they need more excessive and more in-depth treatment. And that's why we use pressure canning for that. Number two. Mm -hmm. Number two is using a wrong cooktop. Now, this is something that not many people know about. Uh, we usually have either a smooth cooktop at home, electric cooktop, or the gas cooktop, right? Uh, gas cooktop is the ideal form of cooktop for canning, no matter it's water bath or pressure canning. However, if you have electric cooktop with the coils or a smooth cooktop, only stick to water bath canner. Pressure canning should not be done on those smooth and electric cooktops uh, because they can actually uh, break the surface or, or actually not create a consistent pressure within your pressure canner. So never use those two, only use gas burner. All right, number three not using canning tools correctly. Now, with any of the field, you have certain tools you use to conduct any kind of action. Your canning also requires certain amazing tools that is, that is going to make your life much more easier. So what are those? Uh, and when you go to the store, what to look for? Uh, for example, I'll give you um, an example. When I was trying to find a canning toolkit for myself, I had to buy two because both the kits had missing pieces in it which uh, I, did, I did not have. So I had to buy two to try and pay for that amount um, to actually um, you know, give me all the tools I need for canning. So the tools are basically the air, uh, air bubbler uh, with a headspace measure. So you will have to measure your headspace uh, when you are canning. So this, actually, this part actually allows you to measure it. This also helps you to remove the air bubbles. So that's also a great tool. The second one, is a jar lifter. Many times I see my clients using it uh, like this. However, use the padded part, that's for your hand and a good grip. The curved part is for your jar, so that's going to help you not get burned and lift your jars very safely. The third one is little tongs. Uh, when you're sterilizing your jars and you wanna access your jar, this tool comes very handy, so you can use that. Uh, the fourth one is funnel. Like any other funnel, it helps to do pour your product better um, without making a mess, right? Sure. And last but not the least, uh, we have magnet. This magnet is a very cool tool because it is going to help you lift your uh, lid that is made with metal. So it's actually going to help you uh, 
you know, and lift your metal rings without touching it, which is, which is very important uh, when you uh, start after you sterilize your jar. So, uh, very good tool. So these are the five tools you will definitely need. All right, Trudy. So we're going to take a little bit of a break because you are not done with your canning conundrums. Uh, we're going to come back and go over the rest of the list that's still on the way. Stick around. Don't marvel life. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Delmarva Life. Before the break, we started a list of 10 canning conundrums. So when we last left you, you just went over all of the tools you need. So what is our next canning conundrum? So our next conundrum is altering the ingredients. And this is something that many of us have done it, including myself when I started canning. Uh, altering the ingredients is going to change the environment within uh, which your food is going to stay preserved. So by changing salt, sugar, fats, thickeners, uh, the consistency basically is going to affect uh, the nature of the food itself. And once if it, that happens, it is going to actually cr not create a conducive environment for the food to stay for a longer period of time so and increase the chances of foodborne illness. All so right. you have to make sure you uh, don't alter the ingredients. Number five. Yes, the so number five is not using tested recipe. If you can do any of the uh, uh, you know tips and tricks I'm telling you, please do this. Uh, this is the most important one, and that is using tested recipe. And so what I mean by that is these are the recipes that are tested in the labs for time, temperature, pressure, acidity, and they have done so many times to create a protocol we call it tested recipe that will be available at the reliable resources like on the USDA website, National Whole Food Preservation Center, uh, the other uh, extension web pages. Uh, so go to that, go to your local extension agent, and they'll be able to help you out with finding those recipes. Number six. The number six is not sterilizing your canning tools. Many times people say that, hey, I just got my can, uh, cans from the market. I don't have to uh, sterilize it because they are brand new. But that's not the case. You have to remember 10 minute rule here. If you're processing your jars for 10 or more minutes, then you don't have to sterilize your jar. But if it is under 10 minutes, you have to sterilize your jar. So you have to make sure you're sterilizing your Jar, the glass jar and the metal ring and the boiling water and your ceiling lid with the simmering water. All right, moving on to number seven. Not making altitude adjustment. And this may or may not be as applicable, but this is also a very important factor. Let's say if you are uh, from Garrett County or uh, you know um, you know any kind of mountainous area which has a higher elevation, you have to make sure you are checking on your altitude level and making adjustments. And your tested recipe will tell you exactly what adjustments in the processing you need to do. So again, go back to your test to recipe. Not resting your jar, you're, you need to rest your jar for at least 12 to 24 hours. Do not touch it, do not do anything. Make sure they are really nicely uh, you know, kept as is for at least 12 to 24 hours. That's the uh, next one important thing. Don't rush it. Number nine. The next one is not following the storage guidelines. Uh, every product is a, uh, stays for a different uh, time span in your storage. Your meat products are not gonna stay for longer than six to eight months. Again, your tested recipe will tell you how long it should stay. So again, follow those guidelines uh, and do not eat food that is past the expiration. Please toss it if it is expired or if it looks slightly uh, off. So please don't touch or eat that food. <laughs> <Discard> <laughs> And I believe we have one more. Yes, ignoring the signs of spoilage. Oh. Um, there are different signs of spoilage. The very first would be if your uh, if the surface of your jar lid looks concave or bulged, that's the sign there is some spoilage going on. If you see a spurting liquid, if the uh, color look different, if you see streaks of dried food in the jar, uh, if you're seeing air bubbles on the top, Please do not touch it. Please do not taste it. It only takes one little, uh, you know, bite of that food to get you sick. And we mm -hmm. all know now more than ever how deadly these microorganisms can be. So please be very careful. Take care of yourself and uh, do it safely. Trudy Patel, thank you so much. You know, you got me in the mood. I think maybe I might get back into that canning thing again. Yes, absolutely. And if you have any questions, get back to me. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you so much.